Howdy, welcome to Elementary Statistics. I am Lance Curtis and this is the lecture for section 2-1, Frequency Distributions. So welcome to chapter two. We're gonna talk about <clears throat> frequency distributions in this first section. Uh, we'll start off by looking at some of the characteristics that frequency distributions have. And then we'll look at different types of frequency distributions, relative frequency distributions, cumulative frequency distributions, and then we'll talk about how to <clears throat> create and manipulate frequency distributions in StatCrunch, which is the statistical software package that we're using for this course. So let's dive in. The key concepts for this section start with this obvious point right here. When working with large data sets, it's often helpful to organize and summarize data by constructing a table called a frequency distribution. Now I say that's obvious because I've worked with lots of different data sets and know that if you can put your data into a graphical format, something that's visual to represent the data, it's often easier to determine characteristics of the data set from that visual representation. I hope that as you begin to work more and more with data sets that you begin to see that that's a pretty obvious assertion as well. Now, again, we're living in the 21st century, so we have computer software for us that, that generates all of these types of frequency distributions. So try not to get hung up too much on the details of how to construct them. What we really want to focus on is what they're telling us about the data set. Of course, you will need to know how to construct a frequency distribution, and we're going to go over that in this lecture as well as in class. So, of course, pay attention to that, but understand that the more important aspect that we want to get across is what is it that the visual representation is telling us? How do we interpret that? That's the, that's the key takeaway. So first of all, let's actually define a frequency distribution. Frequency distributions are also called frequency tables, but either way, they show us how a data set is partitioned among all of several categories, or what's called classes. Okay, so you list the category, and then for each category, you list a number that tells you the frequency of the data value in that category. So you can display this in a graphical format, or you could display it in a tabular format. Either way, you're communicating the same basic information, but the graphical format has some advantages over the tabular format. So for example, you have these different categories here represented. So this is the different bins that you're gonna put your data into. And you have those same categories listed here in this column of the table. So far, we're tit for tat. Now, Look at, see, in the graphical format, in the first column, you've got 75 counts. So you've got 75 data points that are less than 8. And that's exactly what's being said over here in the table. Here in this first category is less than 8. So there's 75 data points that are less than 8. We don't really know how much less than 8 they are. It could be 7, 6, 0, negative 2. I mean, we don't, we don't really know that the category just simply says less than eight. So all the, all the data points that are less than eight, we're gonna put here in this first bin, or class, as it's called. Then we look at the second class. There's 109 data points in that, 181 in the third, so on and so forth. And you get the same information from the table. So again, so far we are tit for tat. But one of the things that the visual representation gives you that's much harder to see from the table is there's a shape to the way that the data is distributed amongst the different classes. So if you connect the tops of each of these bins, you get a general shape of our distribution, as it's called. And that shape can convey information about the characteristics of the data set. We'll get into that a little bit later on. But there's certainly one advantage that the visual graphical format has over the tabular format. Frequency distributions have certain set characteristics. So I'm going to use the table here to illustrate what those are because it's easier to see them uh, on the table than it is on the graph. 
So the first characteristic that we want to look at are the lower class limits. These are the smallest numbers that can belong to any of the different classes or bins. So if you look at the categories, the number that's listed first in each category, that's your lower class limit. Next we have upper class limits. Okay, These are the largest numbers that can belong to different classes. So it's basically the opposite end here of each of your different classes. Notice how there's no lower class limit for the first category. The first category is simply anything lower than 8. Well, that could go all the way out to negative infinity. So there's no lower class limit for the first category because there's no set number to define the lowest possible number that can belong in that class. Then we have what are called class boundaries. These are the numbers used to separate classes but without the gaps created by class limits. So notice how there's a gap between each of the classes. There's a gap between 8 and 9, between 9 and 10, between 8.9 and 9.9, between 9.9 and 10.9. There's gaps between those numbers. But class boundaries okay, are numbers used to separate the different classes. So what determines whether a number belongs in the less than 8 category or the 8 to 8.9 category? Well, if you consider rounding, uh, you're going you're gonna to say, okay, I've got numbers here in my class limits out to one decimal point. So the class boundary is going to go out to two decimal points because anything, for example, here in this 7.95, notice how that's just a little bit less than the 8. So if I say if I have a number that's like 7.9, that's going to round down to less than 8. I'm going to put that number there. Same if I have, say, 7.94. That number is going to round down to less than 8, to 7.9, and therefore I'm going to stick that in the less than 8 category. But if I have, say, a number at 7.97, well, rounding that to one decimal point, I have to round up because it's greater than point than 7.95, so that's going to put it in the 8 to 8.9 category. So this number of 7.95 is the determining standard that's separating out one category from the next. That makes it the class boundary. So notice to get the class boundary, if I want to get, say, like the 8.95, well, it's separating these two categories here, so I'm going to take this upper limit and this lower limit. So the upper limit for one, the lower limit for the next, and I'm going to take the number that's exactly in the middle between those two. That's where the 8.95 comes from. That's where the 9.95 comes from, halfway between 9.9 .9 and 10, so on and so forth. Those are your class boundaries. Now we also have class midpoints. Okay. These are the values in the middle of each of the different classes. And often it's the average of the upper and lower class limits for a given class. So if I take 8 and 8.9, I add that together, and then I take the I divide by 2, so I'm taking the average, I'm going to get technically 8.45. But since all of these numbers here are listed to one decimal point, I'm going to list the class midpoint to one decimal point, and that's going to round up. 8.45 goes to 8.5, and there's my class midpoint. You could also look at it as halfway between successive lower class limits. So it's like halfway between 8 and 9. That's, that's 8.5 right there, halfway between successive class limits. The class width is the, the difference between two successive lower class or two consecutive upper class limits. So here in this case, the class width is 1 because the difference between 8.9 and 9.9 is 1. The difference between 10.9 and 9.9 is 1. Or the difference between 10 and 9 is 1. Or 9 and 8 is 1. One common mistake that students often make when calculating the class width. They look at the upper limit and the lower class limit for the same class. And then they subtract the two out. Notice if you do that, you're going to get 0.9, but the class width is really 1. So be aware that you have to compare two successive or consecutive 
class limits and not just the one from the same category or class to calculate the class width. How do we create frequency distributions? Well, a question that we need to ask before how is why would we even want to do it? Well, there's some good answers to that question. First is, it's an easy way to summarize large data sets. This is especially true with the graphical format. You're providing a visual representation of your data, and it's really easy to summarize a large data set. And believe me, a lot of data sets in the real world are not small. Okay, Many of the data sets that I used to make statistical models for uh, gas turbine units for power generation to put power onto electric grid. I mean, these models were based on tens of thousands of data points, uh, potentially. So you had large numbers of data. Now imagine trying to put 10,000 numbers into a table. I mean, <laughs> how, how many, how, how, how big of a service would you need to put the table in all just one view? I mean, it'd be, it'd be a humongous task, but you could easily make a graph, like a frequency distribution that shows the numbers that are, that are listed here. And you can see by adding the numbers here at the top of each of the different categories, classes, or bins, whatever you want to call them, that you're not going to get a small number. This is actually fairly large. It's a few thousand. So, yeah, it's a good way to summarize large data sets. But it's also an easy way to analyze the nature of the data. As I was saying before, if you connect the tops of each of the categories that you see here in the frequency distribution, you can get a shape that will show you uh, information about the distribution itself. It also gives us a basis for constructing other important graphs. We'll get into that more in a future lecture. So now that we know why we would create the frequency distribution, now we get to the, the real question of how do we go about doing it? Well, the first step, you want to determine how many classes you have, okay? And so how many classes are you going to have in your distribution? How many bins are you going to have to throw numbers into? This makes a big difference because the shape of the distribution will be different depending upon the number of classes you select. Typically, you want to select a number between 5 and 20. You don't want to go below five because then everything just becomes this huge conglomeration and you can't see a shape that's well defined that gives you any useful information about the data that's forming your distribution. Um, you get the same effect though if you go above 20. If you go above 20, then everything just kind of flattens out and you get like one here, one there, one here, one there, and everything just becomes kind of uniform. And again, it obscures that shape that you're looking for, which gives you information about your distribution. So try to keep it between 5 and 20 for the number of classes. Once you've got that number selected, then you go ahead and calculate your class width, okay, using this, this formula right here. So you're going to take the maximum value in your class, subtract the minimum value in your class, and then divide by the number of classes. This gets us the class width. Remember, you're going to round up when you get to that final value. Once you've got your class width, then you're just going to go ahead and choose a starting point. So the lower class limit of the first category is where you're going to start. And typically, it's a minimum data value uh, for a convenient value that's below that. Zero is a good number to pick for a lot of data sets. But again, it's, it's going to depend upon the nature of the data and what the data actually represents. So once you have your starting point picked out, then the next step is to use that starting point with your class width to calculate all the other lower and upper class limits. So if you're starting at zero and your class width is eight, then you're gonna say, okay, I'm gonna go from zero to seven, and then from, or actually 7.9, because then you want the next one to go from eight to 15.9, and then go 16 to uh, 23.9 and so on and so forth. So you just go ahead and just, just build it on just like that. And then you just count the number of data values that are in each class. So then once you've got your bins, you put all the numbers that go into each bin, you count them up, and then you'll just make a simple little bar chart like this. That's your frequency distribution. 
we have what are known different types of dist frequency distributions. Uh, what you saw before is basically your standard frequency distribution, but you can also create what's called a relative frequency distribution. And these are appropriate when you want to focus on the proportion or percentages the, of the total data set that's in each bin instead of the actual count. Sometimes it's more useful to look at proportions or percentages than it is to look at actual counts. Here's an example of a relative frequency distribution. And the way we get the relative frequency is with this handy little equation right here. So we take the class frequency and we're going to divide it by the sum of all the frequencies. So here 2.6 percent comes from taking 2 and then subtracting it from the sum of all the categories. So we take 2 plus 33 plus 35 plus 7 plus 1 and that's going to give us what that's that's 40, 75, 6, uh, 78. So you're going to divide this by 78, and 2 divided by 78 gives you 0 0.026, which when you convert from decimal to, to percentage is 2.6%. The percentage frequency is the class frequency divided by the sum of all the frequencies, and then you just multiply by 100. Okay? So relative frequency is going to be the percentage in decimal form. Because what we see here are percentages. This is technically f percentage frequency, but even though it's a percent, it's often still called relative frequency. So don't get hung up on the on the minute differences here. Just recognize that sometimes uh, there's the, there's people who make the distinction, but really it's all one and the same. Now the table shown here provides an example for each type of frequency distribution for the IQ scores of students enrolled in the same course. So you've got two students who had an IQ score of between 50 and 69, and that is 2.6% of the total population that was tested. Note the difference in information each type of frequency distribution communicates. So again, one's going to communicate the percent in percent form, the other is going to communicate it in decimal form. We can also make what's called a cumulative frequency distribution. So in some instances, this actually proves to be the most useful type of frequency distribution. And in this type of distribution, we've got each class reporting its own count together with the total of all previous classes in the distribution. So what does this mean? Well, let's take a look at this. Observe the frequency distribution of IQ scores from the previous slide. So here we've got the same table, except now instead of relative frequency, now we've got cumulative frequency. So the second class is going to be the total of the counts in the second class plus all previous classes. So we've got 33 that are in this class, but the cumulative frequency takes this frequency, the 33, and adds it to every frequency from every bin before it. So we take 33 plus the 2, that gives us 35. So for the third, we're going to take 35, and we're going to add it to the 35, because that's what comes in all of the frequency bins before it. So 35 plus 33 plus 2 is going to give us 70. 7 plus 35 plus 33 plus 2 gives us 77. 77 and 1 then give us a 78. So sometimes it's actually more useful to, f to present the data in this format. And that's what we see for the third class, and it falls for the entire distribution. We can use frequency distributions to better understand our data. So I was getting before at looking at the shape of the distribution. It can tell you about the data that created it. So to see the shape, all you have to do is imagine there's a line connecting the top of each of the bars in your frequency distribution, and that gives you this, a shape that gives you information about the distribution. So in that instance, if we're actually going to connect you know, each of the tops, you get a shape that looks something like this. This shape approximates what's called a normal distribution. Okay? And in future chapters, we're going to frequently reference this type of data. Okay, data that is normally distributed. Normally, normal distributions have this characteristic bell shape. Okay, 
So the basically start out, if you're reading it like a book from left to right, you're going to start out low, then they come high, they reach a maximum point, and then the other side comes back, it drops back down low again. Now, a true normal distribution is symmetrical, about its center. So the left side is going to mirror the right side. They're going to be mirror images of each other. We can say that a distribution is approximately normal when it has the same sort of pattern, but it's not exact. So here we would see in this distribution is what we would call approximately normal because, okay, here's the maximum. It's not exactly in the center of the distribution, but you've got that same trend of starting low, coming high, then after the high point, you continue to come back down to a low point. Frequency distributions sometimes have gaps. Gaps are important to note because they can indicate the presence of more than one population in your data set. That's important information to have. So <clears throat> one thing you need to notice about gaps is that the reverse is not necessarily true. Okay, A gap often indicates the presence of more than one population. But just because you have more than one population does not mean that you're going to have a gap. It depends on how many classes or categories or bins you use to create your frequency distribution because if you have too few it can hide the gaps that would indicate the presence of more than one population let's look at an example here's a frequency distribution for a data set of the weight of US pennies so we've got a set of pennies here and we weighed them all we found that 18 of them are between 2.4 and 2.49 grams. 19 of them are between 2.5 and 2.59 grams. And then we've got two of them that are between 2.9 and 2.99 grams. 25 between 3 and 3.09 grams. And then 8 between 3.1 and 3.19 grams. So notice that we have here a gap where there's no data being reported. So this set of zeros here is indicating a gap. There's no data in any of these bins. So we actually have two populations of pennies. One over here in this lighter weighted region and one over here in this higher rated region. Sometimes gaps exist where very little data is reported for a category. So sometimes you don't necessarily need to look for a zero. Sometimes it would just be like a one or a two. And again it depends on how many uh, data points that you have, how many uh, categories or bins that you have in your frequency distribution, but generally speaking, you're going to be looking for the zeros. That's going to indicate your gap. In this particular example, you've got two different populations because there was a change made in how the U.S. Mint manufactured pennies. This change occurred in 1983. So if your penny was manufactured before 1983, then your penny was composed of 95% copper and 5% zinc. But after 1983, pennies began to be made with 2.5% copper and 97.5% zinc. Zinc being a less dense metal than copper, it's much lighter than copper, and so the pennies that we see up top that are weighing between 2.4 and 2.59 grams, these are pennies made after 1983. Whereas the pennies down at the bottom of the frequency distribution, the ones that weigh 2.9 grams or more, these were pennies that were made before 1983. Now, you might be wondering, what's the big deal with 1983? And the answer is that two years prior, in 1981, there was a coup in the country of Chile. Chile is one of the world's major producers of copper. Uh, it's it's an integral part of their economy. They have very rich copper ore deposits in Chile, and so it's one of the world's biggest producers of copper. Well, the, there was a coup that took place in the country. Military took control, and they didn't take too kindly to the United States because, quite frankly, we had interfered many times in their country. Um, and, and, as a matter of fact, you know, uh, some of the things that happened in that coup were actually sponsored by the United States clandestinely. Thank you, CIA. And so <clears throat> there was a coup that happened, uh, a lot of political turmoil that took place after that. Uh, a guy named Pinochet, who was basically torturing his own citizens, 
uh, uh, human rights violations galore. It's it, an interesting story to look into if you don't know anything about it. But uh, <clears throat> long story short, uh, it didn't take kindly to the U.S. And so uh, a lot of the copper uh, that we use for things just got curtailed. So it's like, well, we've got a decrease in the copper that's coming in. And so you've got to look and say, what are all the things that we make with copper? Well, we make pennies with copper, but we also make electrical wiring with copper. So if you have a choice of, okay, we've got a limited amount of copper coming in, and we've got to choose between pennies and electrical wiring, what are you going to choose? Well, most people would choose the electrical wiring, and that's exactly what happened. So the bulk of the copper that we could obtain, we were, we were getting into making electrical wiring so we could keep that up. But the pennies, it's like, well, we've got to change that somehow. And so it was like, well, we'll just up the zinc and use a lot less copper. And you can see the difference in the composition. We used a lot less copper. The result was a lighter penny. Frequency distributions are, are adept for analysis. So if we actually look at this example here, this frequency distribution, it's showing the heights of a sample of people at Vassar Road Elementary School. So you've got definitely one population here and another population down here because here in the middle you've got this gap okay separating out two populations what would actually explain the two populations here well you're looking at what's the data represent the data represents people at an elementary school so you've got one population that's really short those are the kids and then you've got Another population that's much taller. These are the adults that form faculty and staff. So looking at the data and identifying gaps in the shape of your distribution, these can actually indicate characteristics of the, of the distribution itself and the data that's used to form that distribution. Let's take a look at an example here involving best actresses. So this frequency distribution represents the age of female Oscar winners for Best Actress when they won the award. So you've got 27 that won the Oscar that were in their 20s. And you've got 34 that won the Oscar when they were in their 30s, so on and so forth. So the question is, what is the class width in this frequency distribution? I'll give you a few seconds to determine that. Okay, so here the class width is 10. Remember in determining the class width, you can't just take the upper and lower limit for a single class and subtract it out. You've got to look across two successive or consecutive categories in order to get that out. So here we take 30 minus 20 or 39 minus 29. Either way, we get 10. That's the class width. Now, what are the class midpoints? Again, I'll give you a moment to determine that. Here we find the class midpoint. So for the first one, it's going to be 24.5. And the way we get that, okay, is by taking the... 20 and the 29 and we go halfway in between them okay that's the midpoint for the class so halfway between 20 and 29 is going to be 24.5 halfway between 30 and 39 is going to be 34.5 and the way you would do that on a calculator is just add the two numbers together and then and then divide by two and that gives you your class midpoint now what are the class boundaries again i'll give you a moment to to decide. Here we go with the class boundaries. So these are the numbers that are determining which numbers go into which bins. So you want to go halfway in between uh, which which bin that we're going to go into. So notice here that we've got halfway between the first two bins, 29.5. So it's halfway between 29 and 30. That's the class boundary between the first and the second classes. 
Notice that we have class boundaries at the beginning and the end. So here at the first, the first class boundary is actually 19.5 because anything lower than 19.5 is not going to be in the distribution. So this class boundary is actually determining what's in the distribution versus what's in the first class. Likewise, here at the other end, we've got 89.5 as the class boundary between the last class and what's, again, not in the distribution. So don't forget these endpoints when you're calculating your class boundaries. Let's take a look at best actors. So here we have similar frequency distribution, the age of Oscar winner for actors, uh, but this is actually best actor. So we have the same frequency distribution. So again, what is the class width? I'll give you a moment to determine that. Okay, again, the class width is 10 because you're only looking at, again, you gotta look at successive or consecutive classes. So 30 minus 20, or 39 minus 29, but you would not go 39 minus 30. Go 30 minus 20, 39 minus 29, that gives us the 10. What are the class midpoints? Again, I'll give you a moment to determine that. Okay, here we have the class midpoints. And again, you're gonna see the same thing we saw before because these bins are exactly the same as they were before. So 24.5, is so gonna go exactly in the middle between lower and upper limits for the same class or category. And then finally, what are the class boundaries? Okay, again, we're gonna see same numbers that we did before. Don't forget this one up top at the front and this one at the bottom the middle, okay? So class boundaries are not just between the classes of your distribution, they're also determining what's not here on the front end and what's not here on the back end. Let's look at a completely different distribution. So here's a frequency distribution for the number of years an elected U.S. president lived after his first inauguration. So we've got eight U.S. presidents that lived uh, less than five years after they were first inaugurated. So this includes the ones that were assassinated and the ones who died shortly after they left office. You've got two who lived between five and nine years after their first inauguration. You've got five that lived between 10 and 14 years after their first inauguration, and so on and so forth. So now the question with this distribution is, what is the class width? Again, I'll give you a moment to determine that. Okay, here the class with this five. Remember, you've got to look at successive or consecutive categories to determine what the class width is. So here you're going to take 5 minus 0, or 9 minus 4, or 10 minus 5, or 14 minus 9. You're not going to take 4 minus 0, or 9 minus 5. Don't do that. Take 5 minus 0, or 9 minus 4. That's going to give you the 5. That's your class width. Next question, what are the class midpoints? I'll give you a moment to determine that. Okay, here's a list of the class midpoints. So again, you want to look at, for the same class, this is where you subtract the two and then you divide by two. So here you've got, here you've got zero minus four, which is four, and then take half of that, that's gonna give you two. Okay, so then here you've got nine minus four, I mean, excuse me, nine minus five, so that's gonna give you four. Take half of that, it's gonna give you two, but then because this is not zero, you gotta add the two to this lower limit. So five plus two gives us 
7. Again, the same with the next. So you're going to have 14 minus 10. So that's going to be 4. Divide by 2, that gives you 2. Add the 2 to the 10, and that gives you 12. So on and so forth. Okay, that's the class midpoint. Now, what are the class boundaries? Okay, here we have the class boundaries. So all I'm doing is I'm looking at the difference between these two classes. So here I've got five for, this, for the lower limit of the second class, and here I've got four for the upper limit of the first class. Halfway in between four and five is 4.5. Halfway between nine and 10 is 9.5, so on and so forth. Notice again, I've got class boundaries on the end and on the front. And this one is very particular because it's a negative number. Now, this distribution is recording the years that a president of the United States lived after the first inauguration. How could that possibly be negative? Well, it can't. But when you're calculating the class boundaries, sometimes they come out to be a negative number or a number that can't be represented in your distribution. So don't think that just because you're starting at zero and you can't have a negative number, that the class boundary is therefore not going to be, you don't have to subtract out to get this first one. You do have to do that. So here we've got you know, 0.5 away from 4, 0.5 away from 5 to give us this class boundary. So we just take 0.5 away from 0, and that gives us the negative 0.5. Here on the other end, same thing. We just take 0.5 away from uh, distance away from 39, and that gives us a 39.5. So one of the things we're going to do uh, when you come into class is we're going to get integrated into StackCrunch. We're going to start learning how to use the software. You're free to learn how to use the software outside of class. And in fact, I highly encourage you to start uh, experimenting with it, you know, trying to push some buttons and see what things do and try to get comfortable with how the software is used before you come to class. Uh, even if you don't get comfortable with the software before class, at least try it out because then that will create better questions for you when you come to, to make to me when you come to class. One of the things you're going to want to do is join the StackCrunch group for my class because very often what we'll do in class uh, and also in these videos is I'm going to reference data sets that you can use to run through different examples to show you how to use the software and um, work specific problems that you're going to see on your homework and it's easier to do that if we if we're all using the same data set well the way that we're doing that is by using this feature of StackCrunch called grouping or groups so I have a, a group located inside StackCrunch so the first thing you want to do to join the group is to open StackCrunch now there's two ways you can go about this you can actually go into the course inside my math lab or my stat lab and then one of the menu options there on the left tab side of the screen is going to be stack crunch so you just select that and that gets you into stack crunch from the course the other way to get there and this is how i typically go there is i just go to my browser and then enter in stackcrunch.com in the url field and then that takes me directly to the stack crunch site i'm going to have to log in and the way you log in is with the same credentials that you log into my math lab or my stat lab. So use the same email address for the username, same password, and it gets you right into StackCrunch. So by registering for the class, you actually have a StackCrunch account already set up. So once you get into StackCrunch, then what you're going to want to do is click on this little arrow up at the top next to Explore. And you're going to see this little menu come down, and you want to select the option on the end for groups. So you're just going to click on groups, and then you're going to get a screen, and this is a partial screenshot that you see here. In the group screen, there's an option over here on the left that says view options, browse all, and then there's a little search, a search field. So in that search field, you're going to want to search for the name of the group, which is CWI Math 153 Curtis, C-U-R-T-I-S. 
So type that into the search field. You'll press search. It'll pop up there. You'll select it. And then it'll ask you if you want to join the group. You say yes. And then uh, in order for you to actually join the group, though, I have to approve you. So it'd be very helpful if you actually join the group before you come to class because then I can actually make all those approvals before you come to class and then we get you all set up and ready to go and we don't have to spend class time adding people in. Uh, and We can spend more of the class time actually answering your questions and showing you how to use the software. So make sure you, you uh, put in your request to join the group before you come to class. Once uh, you actually have data in StackCrunch, you can create frequency distributions. Okay, so join the group in StackCrunch for the class, and then there's actually an Oscar winner's age data set. So you go in and you open it, and you can begin to create a frequency distribution by looking at that data set. So once you load it up, it's going to come up Oscar winner ages. That's the name of the data set. And then you're going to see a column of ages for actresses and ages for actors. And here's the names of the different columns up here at the top. So then once you get once you get the data loaded into StackCrunch, you can start making your frequency distribution by going here to graph, and then the drop-down menu appears. You're going to select this item right here at the top, bar plot, and then you get two options with bar plot. You have with data and with summary. Because you actually have data here in the data table fields, you're going to select with data. Once you do that, then this options window is going to pop up. Okay, so make sure that you select first the column that has the data that you want to include in your distribution. So if we start out, we're just going to print a data, uh, excuse me, frequency distribution of the actresses and the age at which they win the, the uh, Oscar award. So we're going to make sure that we select actresses here up here at the top with the column. And then all these other options that you see here are standardized, they're default options, and for most of our purposes, you're just going to take the defaults. There will be some instances where you'll select other options, and I'll let you know what those are. But just for your general frequency distribution, just take the defaults and just run with that. So then you come down here at the bottom and hit Compute, and then you'll actually get a frequency distribution that pops out. Here's a frequency distribution that pops out in a separate results window. So once you select uh, that compute button, this is what you see. Uh, for large data sets, okay, before you even see this window though, StackCrunch will usually ask if you want to bin the data. Okay, just go ahead and click OK. If you ever get asked that question, just click OK. Let the computer do the work for you. Okay, then you'll see this results window that shows you your frequency distribution. Now, let's say you look at this and you're like, Oh my gosh, I made a mistake. Or, you know what, I'm looking at this something and I want to change one of the options. You can actually go back to that options window. You don't have to start all over from scratch. Go back to that options window by just clicking this options uh, button right here at the top of your results window. And it takes you back to that options window that we saw before where you can change whatever options you want. And then it'll put out a new results window with those updated options. If you make a frequency distribution for Best Actress and Best Actor uh, for Oscar winners, you get these two diff distributions right here. Okay, So if you want, go ahead and pause the video and then go into StatCrunch and try to make these frequency distributions to see how well you can get with the software and do it. So feel free to pause the video now and I'll wait a couple seconds for you to go ahead and pause the video and then go ahead and make your frequency distributions and then come back and we'll talk about them. Okay, so now that you've made your frequency distributions, I hope that they look like what you see here. So the one on the left is for Best Actress, the one on the right is for Best Actor. And you should see uh, frequency distributions like the ones here. If you don't see what, what you see here on the screen, then that's a great question to bring to class and say, look, you know, this is what I created, but this is what you got. So what's the difference here? What did I do different? And we can actually investigate that and look at that. That's something, that's something that would be great to ask. 
But once you get these frequency distributions, the question then becomes, what can you conclude from this comparison? Well, one thing you can do is look at the shape of your distribution. So look at the shape here of the distribution for best actress and look at the shape here for best actor. Notice that the bulk of the data for best actor is really in the middle of this range of categories. Whereas for actresses, it's shifted, it's skewed over here towards the left side of your, of your, of your graph. So one of the things that we can get by comparing that shape of the distribution is that we like our women young, but we like our men middle-aged. And I mean, when you're talking about movie stars, that's the truth, right? I mean, we like the women young and we like the men middle-aged. So that's one thing you can conclude from, from comparing the data. Another thing you can look at by comparing the data is look at the tails of your distribution. So the tails are where you don't have a whole lot of data. And notice the age ranges for the tails. So, you know, we, we can deal with middle-aged women, but we can't really deal so much with the older women. The, as far as movie stars go and, and for best actresses, yeah, they're there, but they're few and far between. The same thing on the men. Okay, although on the men's side, we have two different tales. We've got the really young guys who are really just more than immature punks for the most part. And I can speak because I used to be one. And then we have the really old guys who, uh, well, for the most part, they just, you know, they tend to be senile. And um, that's definitely what we see with the actors. So, yeah, we just, I mean, look at the tales of your distribution. That can also tell you things about the uh, data that's underlying the distribution. We can create relative frequency distributions in scatcrunch. So if you go and you open up the POTUS data file, it's in the class group screen. And again, you won't be able to do this until uh, I actually approve you. But once you get that approved, go ahead and go into the POTUS data file and you can practice this after class, if by chance I don't get you approved before class, that's fine. But once you get the data into the into the stack crunch, then go ahead and and create your relative frequency distribution by taking the steps that we saw before. But then when you get to the options window, you're gonna under type, which is right here in the middle, you're gonna select percent. You're not gonna take the default value. You're gonna take percent. Now you may be asking to yourself, okay. We're making a relative frequency distribution. Why don't we just select relative frequency? Why are we selecting percent? Well, you can actually experiment with this if um, you want to. But when you select relative frequency, you'll see the percent va values in decimal form. And most of us, when we're dealing with percentages, don't think in decimal form. We think in terms of percentages <laughs> in percent form. So if you, sh if you select percent, it'll give you those percent values in percent form. When you do that, you should get something that looks like this. So again, you know, if you make your distribution, it comes out different. That's a great question to bring up to find out, okay, what, are, what am I doing differently to get something that doesn't look like this? Once you do get this, observe the shape of the resulting distribution. Does this distribution appear to be normally distributed? Well, think back on what we talked about before about the shape of a normal distribution. Is that the shape that we see here? And I hope you answered no, it's not the shape that we see here. Because normal distributions start low, come up to a high point, and then come back low again. Here we start high, come low, and then come back high. Then we got kind of a roller coaster right here. So this is not normally distributed. Now, does it tell you anything about the underlying data? We don't have a normal distribution, but does the shape we do have tell you anything about the, the distribution that we do have? I'll give you a few seconds to determine that.
Well, one of the things that we know about this relative frequency distribution, okay, the numbers that we see here at the top of the columns, they're actual percentages, okay? So 24%, that's nearly a quarter of all presidents of the United States are going to die within five years of taking office. So what that means is you've got a one in four chance of dying during your first term because the term of the presidency is four years. So uh, that's, you know, I mean, that's a pretty dangerous job when you think about it. One in four chance of dying within, you know, uh, your first term. And that's, that's pretty significant. So that's one of the things that this, this tells us. Um, look at where the bulk of the data is. So we've got a lot here. If you can make it, if you can make it past your fifth year, okay, then your chances are pretty good that you're going to live, you know, another five to 15 years because the bulk of the data is centered here between 10 and 30 years. So you've got a good chance of living a long life if you can just make it past, past that fifth year. We can create cumulative frequency distributions in StackCrunch. Again, if you put the POTUS file into StackCrunch, uh, you can create a frequency distribution. But first you have to, in order to create the cumulative frequency in StackCrunch, and this is one of the areas where it actually breaks down, becomes a little obnoxious, you actually have to put in the frequency distribution in tabular form in order to get a cumulative frequency distribution to come out. So you have to hand type. Here we've got a column that's got just the column names. So these are the class limits. So 0 to 5, 5 to 10, 10 to 15, so on and so forth. So these are the different bins. We put that in a separate column. And then these are the frequency counts for each individual column. And then we finally have, here in this third column, we have the cumulative frequency. So we have 8 comes over, 8 and 2 is 10, 8 and 2 and 5 is 15, so on and so forth. Once you get that typed in, then you can go in, create your frequency distribution like you normally would, except here, under order by, you're going to click on count ascending. Notice the type is listed as frequency, so you're just going to leave that standard default selection. But here under order by, you're going to collect, you're going to click on count ascending. That's the one you want to select. When you do, it reorganizes your data so that, woo, look at that, it's actually counting by ascending, okay? Now, there's an option in here where you can actually put the numbers up on top. So you can actually, you know, list this with the numbers actually on top, and you can see the numbers getting bigger. Those will be the numbers that you see here. So we go 8, 10, 15, 22, 26. You can actually see the numbers. You don't have to try to read the graph because sometimes that can be a hard thing to do. But yes, you can create commutative frequency distributions in StackCrunch. Here's an example for us to consider. So we're looking at the analysis of last digits from uh, people who gave their weight as part of the California Health Interview Survey. So the data of all these weights was taken and the last digits from 50 randomly selected respondents uh, are, were collected and they're listed in the data file called last digits. So they're in our StackCrunch group for the class. Uh, if you open up the file called last digits, you can then construct a frequency distribution. So I'm going to pause, I'm going to ask you to pause the video, then go in and uh, get that, get that data set, last digits, and then go into StackCrunch and once you have the data in StackCrunch, construct a frequency distribution that has 10 classes in it. I'll go ahead and I'll go ahead and pause the video. And then uh, when you get ready, come on back and we'll talk about it. Okay, so I hope you didn't have too much trouble creating your frequency distribution. You should get something that looks like this. This is the dis distribution for those last digits that have 10 classes in it. So now that you've got the frequency distribution, we can take a look at it, observe the resulting distribution. Look at the shape. Quite a lot of zeros. And we got quite a lot of fives. So it goes high, 
really dips down, then comes back up, spikes back up here, it comes back down again, spikes back up, comes back down. So these numbers down here are all in relatively the same ballpark, but we've got quite a disparity here. We've got a lot of zeros and a lot of fives. So with that in consideration, do the heights appear to be reported or actually measured? I'll give you a few seconds to decide. Okay, in this case, you're going to say that the heights actually appear to be reported. Okay, they're not actual measurements because if they were actual measurements, we should see a more randomized uh, dis distribution that corresponds with that shape of that bell curve for the normal distribution. So we don't really see that here. What we see is a disproportionate amount of zeros and fives. And so that kind of indicates that, yeah, maybe this isn't actually measurement. Maybe there's people just reporting what they think their weight is or what they want other people to think their weight is. What can you say about the accuracy of these results? Again, I'll give you a few seconds to answer. Well, certainly we can say that it's not likely that they're very accurate. I mean, if you've got a disproportionate amount of a certain uh, category or bin, then that population, or sample rather, is not going to represent the population as a whole, and therefore the conclusions that we get from analyzing this sample are not going to be very applicable to the population in general. So it's not likely it's not likely that the results are very accurate. Here we have another example involving red blood count. So red blood cell count in units of million cells per microliter was obtained from a sample of 40 women aged 18 to 62. The data was then used to create a frequency distribution table, which you see there on the left. So use the table shown here to construct a graphical frequency distribution in StackCrunch. So again, go ahead and pause the video, and then when you get done, come on back and we'll talk about it. Now remember, when you're creating a frequency distribution from a table inside StackCrunch, you have to manually input the table into StackCrunch. So go ahead and type in what you see here in the frequency distribution table into StackCrunch and then go ahead and use the menu options to make your frequency distribution. And when you get back, come on, unpause the video and we'll talk about what you made. Okay, I hope that you actually got through that and uh, without too much trouble. So now let's take a look at what this should look like. Here's what you should get when you create the frequency distribution in StackCrunch. So when you actually select these columns for the, ta for, for the table, you're actually going to get, notice how these bins represent what you actually type in here for the category numbers. And then here's the different categories that you have here, 2, 13, 15, 7, 2, 1. There's the counts for the different categories. So this is what your frequency distribution should look like. So the question asked is, do the data appear to be normally distributed? I'll give you a few seconds to determine. And the answer is yes, the data do appear to be normally distributed. Now it's not exact, okay? An exact normal distribution would have the highest value smack dab in the middle and here it's shifted to the left a little bit. Uh, the exact normal distribution would be a mirror copy of the left and the right sides, but we don't really have that here. There's no real symmetry, but the same general pattern of starting low and then coming to a high point and then coming back, dropping down low again, we do see that pattern here. So it's not exact, but yes, the data do appear to be roughly normally distributed. Flight taxi out time. So the time required for a passenger plane to take uh, to taxi to the runway for takeoff position 
uh, is obtained for a sample of 48 different flights for the same airline. Airlines do this all the time. They use statistical analysis on all their different operations because it's really helpful for creating efficiencies and reducing costs, which they can then pass on to the customer. I'm not saying that they do, I'm just saying they can. Uh, the data was then used to create a frequency distribution table, which you see there on the right. So go ahead, use this table, construct a graphical cumulative frequency distribution in StackCrunch. Remember, this is not a relative frequency distribution or a standard di frequency distribution. This is the cumulative frequency distribution. So go ahead and <clears throat> create that in StackCrunch uh, after you pause the video. And then when you come back, unpause the video and we'll talk about it. Okay, I hope that you didn't have too much trouble making that graph. Here's what you should actually end up looking like, the commutative frequency distribution for this frequency distribution table. So remember for the commutative, you've got to take the frequency counts for each one and you've got to add them to, to each other. So here 10 plus 20, so you're going to have 10, and then 10 plus 20 is 30, and then plus 9 is going to be 39, plus 1 is going to be 40. So you go ahead and list all that out. And then here we have <clears throat> cumulative frequencies with percentages listed up at the top instead of the actual counts themselves. So 20.8% of all the data is here in this first. And then by the time we get to the second category, now we've gone through 62.5%. So what do we see from looking at a graph like this? Well, first of all, we want to ask ourselves, does the distribution suggest that the time required to taxi out can be predicted with reasonable accuracy. So take a look at this graph and I'll give you a few seconds to decide. The answer is no. Times vary over a considerable range. And although many flights do taxi out quickly, many others require much longer times. So yeah, I mean, you've got this jump right here early on, okay, up to 62.5%. So, you know, the majority of your taxi out times are under 20 minutes, okay, which I don't know if you think that's reasonable or not. I guess it depends on your standard. You've got a 1 in 5 chance of getting there in less than 15 minutes. And then... It jumps up to 62.5. So the actual bulk of the data is actually right here. The majority of your data is actually right here. So, you know, many flights do taxi out quickly. But look at all these other bins that we've got. Okay. So, yes, we've got, you know, the occasional ones that comes out one, two, 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 two. It doesn't actually quite peter out to zero. It just keeps going out and out and out. So, yeah, the actual times are varying over an entire range. And yes, the bulk of the data is over here on the short end. But, you know, there are those flights which have much longer times. I'd hate to be sitting in, you know, one of those flights that's, you know, taking you more than 45 minutes to taxi out to the runway. My goodness, that's just, that's ridiculous. Um, but sometimes, you know, that's, that's the way the cookie crumbles. So, uh yeah, so there is some variation there, but, you know, the bulk of it is, is early on. And that brings us to the end of the video. Uh, thank you for watching. Uh, if you have any questions, be sure to email me or, you know, come find me, you know, uh, in class or before class or after class. And uh, other than that, I will see you in the next video or in class, whichever comes first.